All right, hello class and welcome back. So in the first part of this lecture, we uh, discussed some peculiarities of nonlinear systems and uh, sort of gave an, a, an impression of how things can go very badly for nonlinear systems. However, we gave conditions, at least under the, on the representation of f, uh, x dot equals f of x, We give uh, conditions on the representation, f, under which, well, things don't go that badly, right? Under which there exists a solution, and it's unique, and it behaves in many of the ways we would expect that a solution to operate. So in this very short, rather brief, uh, set of uh, lectures, or slides, we will um, take that basis, right, the sort of fundamentals of uh, the existence of solutions, and, uh, and try and extend that and see, see where we can get with that. Uh, so specifically, we're going to be looking at now thinking of the system as G, or the uh, equivalent parameter as, as a solution map, uh, which takes an initial condition X and produces an output, which is the state of the solution X of T, or the solution. Um, x of t. And we'll treat that as a signal, right? Right. Now, obviously, this is going to be a nonlinear map, right? It's a nonlinear map from x to, in the, x to, to the solution, x of t, which is a function. Uh, in the linear case, of course, uh, this, uh, this was just uh, x of t equals e to the a t x. Right, so it was a linear map, right? So that, right, it just depends on x. You add two x's together, you get a new solution. In this case, of course, it won't be a nonlinear map because we're dealing with nonlinear systems. But we will do our best to construct some kind of mathematical equivalent of the nice H infinity L two gain uh, Banach algebra of systems, which we we were able to establish in the linear case. We won't obviously be able to go so far, but we'll be, we'll, we can get something close to that, right? So in this brief lecture, again, we're going to be talking about input output properties of this system. And then, of course, we should start by defining what we mean by that system. So let's first talk about what we mean by state, so the input, right? This is the input. So this is, this is an important distinction to make, or an important point to make, because they, we talk about ideas of state, um, and we often think uh, conflate them with initial conditions, which is good, but the initial conditions only apply at the initial time, right? And we want to extend that idea to any time, basically. So the state of a system, so the, this thing that we're defining, the state, right, is a is sort of no, notional, right? It's a thing on which the solution map is defined. So we can define it notionally as the thing which we established um, the Cauchy condition under which the solution map exists. <laughs> That's a very uh, convoluted statement. But uh, l let's break it down a little bit and just say it's the information under which we can propagate the solution forward in time. Right. So it's the uh, this it's a set of constraints, if you will, um, on 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 the on the system such that we have existence and uniqueness forward in time. Uh, and for all time, we're assuming that the uh, solution map exists for all time. Right? So, right, for every element of the state, for every state, one and only one solution should exist. The Cauchy problem should be, be well posed. So we can really swap this idea of, uh, of state with, uh, with the initial condition if we allow for our initial condition to depend on time, right? So, right. So x of t, for example, right, if we're given an x of t, uh, we can find uh, 
uh, x of t plus s for all s greater than t. All s greater than t. Right. So we focus on that aspect of the Cauchy problem uh, concerning initial conditions, basically. So at any time, we were given this amount of information, we can add the constraint, right, x of t equals x, maybe put a t there, and that allows us to define the solution for all points forward in time. So this is not entirely trivial, trivial of course, because we sometimes we don't have exist solutions, and sometimes they're not unique, and we need both of those in this case to define our solution map. It also precludes the, this idea that uh, trajectories can cross, right? So in two dimensions, so you say so you have the, this, this solution, right? The, no, the solution can't cross itself, so it can't go like that, right? Why? Because at this time, right, x of t, right, uh, in, if the trajectories were to cross, right, uh, then uh, uh, at this time, uh, so, so it, say this is t1, it crosses uh, this initial t1, and this is t2, uh, the, if we had x of t1 as our state at t1, it would lead to this solution. And we had our x, our, our state x of t2 at this time, it would necessarily, because the solutions are unique, also have to follow that line. So it couldn't go down this way. So entwined with the notion of state is the fundamental property that uh, solutions can't cross because if you're at the same state at different times, that should still lead to the same solution, right? so that the solution doesn't depend on time, right? Or the forward content continuation of the solution doesn't depend on it. So, this is, so basically our property is that the solution is time invariant, or the system is time invariant. Right. So, and I should actually maybe add time invariant systems to our definition here. So this, uh, for, for, Rn, uh, you know, this is fairly straightforward for uh, for ODEs like x dot equals f of x. Uh, the notion of of, of state is, is almost certainly x, right? x of t, unless of course there's duplicate states or something like that. But uh, we'll we'll ignore those those special cases. For other systems, uh, it's a little bit less clear. Uh, so, for example, for time delay systems where you have uh, that the dynamics depend not just on what's going on here, but what went on in the past, right? It turns out that the, uh, the state of the system uh, at any given time, t, is not just its current state, but the history over the value of delay, t minus tau, right? So this entire segment of the trajectory is the state for a time delay system, right? Because all, you need to know all of that information in order to continue this trajectory forward in time. For a PDE, right, where we've got sort of uh, spatial dynamics going on here so that we have sort of this uh, flow pattern and maybe uh, it's turbulent in some area, something like that, right? Uh, in order to define, to continue that solution forward in time, to continue that initial condition, we actually have to know the value of uh, the, uh, uh, whatever variable heat or whatever it happens to be, everywhere in the domain, right? Because uh, if we, we lack information, say, for example, here, right, we won't be able to, uh, we won't be able to, to figure out uh, wh what happens um, to, to in, the, in, the, in that little part of the domain. So we need to know everywhere uh, the, the value of, the, of the, the initial condition. And in fact, actually, in time, in PDEs, it's a little bit more complicated because we have boundary conditions and they restrict our notion of stability, uh, of state. Uh, so for example, we can't have a state which violates our boundary conditions. Anyway, but we won't, we won't get into PDEs too, too, too much in this course. Uh, actually, not at all. Anyway, but if we have a notion of state, then we can define a notion of solution map, right? Which takes that state, x here, and moves it by amount delta t 
to another state. So x of t and x of t plus delta x, delta t. Right. So we uh, so for a uh, a given x, right, and a given t, we have uh, this uh, uh, a forward time, um, and we can go a little bit further then, and we're actually, that's what the, the approach we're going to take, remember, because we want to take uh, this uh, input, x of t, and produce the output, which is the forward continuation of that initial condition. So actually, our block diagram should look more like this. We give it a state, and we're producing the output of the slate, so the solution associated with that state, which we know exists because of existence and uniqueness. Okay, so that's uh, that's armed with this uh, this notion of solution map, uh, and thinking of terms of the block diagram here, x of t to x of t plus s for s in zero infinity, we can define start defining properties of this map, right? Notions of stability, properties of the of the map. So here I put s, right? And so I'm uh, just going to uh, leverage now our notion of a solution map to actually write the output here as g of x of t, and then put a little dot there to indicate s, right? The, how far you've pushed it forward in time. So the properties of this solution map. Um, you know, we don't need to get very we don't need to allow too much flexibility so we can we can we can just equivalently since the time system is time invariant we can just go with this x naught comma c dot where that's s so this is a function and this is a vector in rn right and so what we're going to be looking at is map is properties of the map from that function from that vector in rn to the function itself which is the output, uh, the solution. Right? So first of all, let's think about where that uh, that function should lie. Right? Where does that function lie? What what are the properties of this function? So because we assumed the Cauchy problem was well posed, uh, we know that the solution map gives us continuous functions. Right? So if we think of uh, as t as a as sort of a, a dummy variable here. This function here, as a function of t, is continuous. And so because it's continuous, we can actually uh, talk about the size of that function. So again, we have talked about several metrics for the size of a signal. All right. And if we're talking about continuous maps right now from x to g of x, um, the most obvious metric which is well defined now is the supremum, uh, the, the norm, the maximum value that x takes for, as you propagate it forward in time. So to start off, we're going to talk about uh, the size of the signal as being the uh, sup norm of g of x comma or the infinity norm, if you prefer. Right? So the maximum value of that signal. Right? So that's, that's this uh, C bar. Right? So uh, right, it's, the, uh, it's the maximum size. So it's a ball, ma size, smallest ball that this uh, signal is contained in. Right? So now we've, uh, we define our solution map. And we know right, that for any given initial condition that uh, the, uh, the output will be continuous. Right? And so hopefully that, that norm will be well defined. Um, however, we haven't proved that it's actually bounded at this point. Right? It's going to be bounded for any finite time. And so our most basic condition then is continuity of G. Right? This is continuity of G. Not boundedness of G per se, but continuity. So 
basically we say that uh, we, we, we call it Lyapunov stable for reasons which will be obvious in the, the next part of the lecture. Uh, so we say the system is, Lips is Lyapunov stable, basically, if it's, it's continuous, if the solution map is continuous. And continuous at the origin, that's an important caveat to add there, right? Continuous at the origin. So that small deviations from the origin in your initial condition or your state result in small deviations of this function in terms of this infinity norm, the soup map, soup norm. Okay. So the sort of a graphical interpretation we often think about when we're talking about continuity, right, is for any epsilon. So any given epsilon, uh, we can make the solution lie within that epsilon by finding a delta, which we need, given an epsilon, we need to find delta, which is going to depend on epsilon, uh, such that if x lies in delta, or smaller than delta, then this will be uh, smaller than epsilon. So let me erase some things here. So Lyapunov stability means if x naught is less than delta, that implies that the size of g x comma delta infinity is less than epsilon. So for any epsilon, there exists a delta such that this is true. Right? So that we can force uh, the solution to, sl to lie entirely in some ball of radius epsilon by making our initial condition sufficiently small. So that's a notion of stability, which is basically continuity. So the most basic property of the system, right? that it's continuous. It's a, it's a continuous map from state to solution. Um, okay. So this is a system which is stable. This is actually an easier one, but uh, it's, it's important to know, I think, uh, because we can see here, let's see if I draw my balls right, I can, I can prove this. Um, so yeah, I'm looking for a place where the, uh, the trajectories seem to uh, leave a ball, for example. Um, so for example, uh, say this is uh, my desired ball of radius uh, uh, epsilon. Right. Um, <clears throat> so not all trajectories which start within epsilon stay in epsilon. So this one, for example, leaves the ball of radius epsilon, perhaps. Um, but if I started a little bit smaller, so if I started here, then those trajectories would stay within the ball of radius epsilon. So obviously, if I chose my norm a little bit smarter, I, maybe I could have uh, improved this, uh, this metric a little bit. But uh, in any case, that's, that's the idea, right? I can, I, if I want to stay within an epsilon ball, there exists a delta which will enforce that. Uh, Lyapunov stability is, 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 you can also think of it as sort of the generalization of neutral stability. So if we had an initial condition, right, looks like our solution uh, looks like this, right, which is neutrally stable, it's still bounded, right? So if I make my initial condition smaller, actually, I should make my initial condition smaller. If I make my initial condition smaller, the, sign, the uh, oscillation will be smaller as well, and I can make it as small as I like. But it doesn't require that it converges to zero at this point. So this is a basic notion of continuity. Um, we can extend that, uh, this uh, notion of continuity of the solution map, right, uh, globally. So this was, uh, the previous one was local uh, continuity. Lo con continuity at, the, at a point, um, x naught. And we can extend that to global stability if, uh, if, it, if, this, if the system is, is um, uh, globally Lyapunov stable. So it doesn't, we, so if you noticed in this, uh, in this definition, right, um, contains an open neighborhood of the origin. Um, if there's a, so it's a stable on a, on a subset, right, basically. 
So on a, um, a, a set which contains the origin, right, and, but if you allow your epsilon ball to be lower outside that set, then the, the stability definition no longer applies. In the global uh, version, we, uh, we extend this to uh, uh, um, uh, basically uh, continuity everywhere in Rn. Not uniform continuity yet, uh, not, not, not even Lipschitz continuity, but just continuity everywhere on Rn. So if, it's, uh, if D is Rn, basically. So that's sort of neutral stability. We can get a little bit stronger, not too much stronger, but a little bit stronger uh, if we add asymptotic stability to the mix. So basically now we want not only a map from initial condition to bounded functions, g of x comma c dot bounded, but we also require an additional property now, and this is harder to, uh, to put in the, explain in the system context, that the uh, limit, right, as t goes to infinity of g of x comma t equals zero. Right. So basically, uh, it's, it's, con it's continuous and every uh, output for any in a given in, uh, initial condition, every output converges to the origin. Right? So it satisfies this Lips Lipschitz, uh, this uh, continuity property, this Lyapunov stability, and ultimately, we don't, but we don't have a limit on how long it takes, ultimately uh, the trajectory will eventually go to the origin. So local asymptotic stability uh, is stronger than Lyapunov stability. So uh, asymptotically, by definition, implies, uh, uh, implies Lipschitz continuity, or Lyapunov stability, sorry. Um, so technically it says uh, uh, local asymptotically stable, blah, blah, blah on D, uh, if it defines a map, which is continuous at the origin, that's the important part, continuous, that gives you uh, Lyapunov stability. And it maps to G, which is the set of functions which converge to the origin. So asymptotic stability, stronger than Lyapunov stability, but really not telling you much more uh, in terms of system properties. So again, well, we can extend the you know asymptotic stability globally, right? For d equals r n, right? Um, and so that's just a little sidebar up there. But more importantly, and uh, for us uh, more sort of conceptually satisfying, is the notion of exponential stability, which maps uh, g to x comma c dot. And obviously, if we're uh, exponentially stable, we're all, we're, we're, this is stronger than continuity, this is stronger than Lyapunov stability, so it automatically implies uh, uh, Lyapunov stability. Right. But it's not equivalent to it, it's, it's, it's actually much stronger. And so it, what basically what it says, for any uh, initial condition, x naught, the solution is less than uh, this k e to the negative gamma t. So there exists a k, which I think of as an amplification factor. So that gives us continuity. Multiplied by an exponentially decaying function, uh, e to the negative gamma t. And that gives us something even stronger. That gives us, so this is going to give us a uh, uniform continuity. In fact, actually, it gives you a sort of Lipschitz continuity in the system sense. Uniform continuity. The k gives us uniform continuity. And the e to the gamma t is going to actually give us L2 boundedness. So that actually, um, what this is going to allow us to do is going to say that this system is L2 bounded, right? So that g of x comma. If we take the L2 norm of that, that's less than, well, there's some factor C, K, uh, times X. 
where that's Rn, of course. Right? So that's 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 a that's a very important, right? That L2 boundedness. So, but let me just go through the definition here. Uh, it's exponentially stable, and we say locally here because it's on a, a set D, right? If it goes beyond that, then it's a different story. Uh, so that's an important thing to, to make, pay attention to. Um, but the, more broadly, right, if the, there's a solution map, which maps, again, here, right, that's asymptotically stable, but not even necessary. This is the most important part, that the function, the output function of the system is less than k times a decaying exponential. So this term is right always less than or equal to 1. But this term can be greater than 1. Right? So basically it says that uh, you've got a, a ball here, which is your initial conditions of size 1. Uh, then the solution is less than a ball of size k, but with a decaying exponential. Right. So it says that uh, we have this continuity factor where the, the soup norm, right? So the soup norm um, of the output, soup over t, x comma t, is less than k x. Right, the soup norm uh, is is less than that. So this is gives us uh, uniform continuity And then more importantly if we integrate the solution, right? So if we integrate uh, G squared DT Right, that's less than or equal to K squared integral e to the negative gamma t uh, dt and then we can pull out our x because it doesn't depend on t and this of course you integrate an exponential and it's just uh, um, well it's um, gamma negative gamma 1 over gamma um, e to the negative gamma t and then you take the limits of that 0 to infinity and uh, infinity goes to 0 and that's just equal to 1 over gamma, right? Um, and of course, this is squared, right? But we're going to ignore that for now. So it gives you a bound on the L2 gain of the, uh, of the output of, the, of your system here. We can replace C with gamma, I think, or is it gamma squared? Uh, don't, don't quote me on that. But anyway, it gives you an L2 bound on the size of the output. And then, of course, we can extend local exponential stability to global exponentially if d equals rn. Right. So, in a way, this local exponential stability is, well, it's a sufficient condition, right? You, your output can have a, 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 an L2 gain bound even if it doesn't satisfy exponential stability, but that's rare, right? So, essentially, our exponential stability criterion are giving our almost, they're not necessary and sufficient, but it's a pretty close to uh, necessary and sufficient condition for the uh, L2 boundedness of the system. So we can sort of treat it like, uh, it's not a Banach algebra, right? So don't get, we can't treat it as a block diagram. We can't do block diagram algebra, but we can have some of these basic conditions such as L2 gain boundedness, right? For these, uh, these uh, locally exponentially stable systems. So now we've talked about uh, the properties. Uh, we, well, we talked about weird things. We talked about properties of the solution in terms of Lyapunov stability, etc. And now we're going to talk about Lyapunov functions, uh, ways optimization problems for enforcing these properties. So optimization problems, which enforce properties of the system. And again, uh, the representation of the system will come in there as well. But the, uh, the, the theory, right, is we're going to use that solution map, uh, the properties of the solution map, uh, to prove uh, the, these properties, uh, Lyapunov stability and L2 boundedness. 
So we're going to pause for a minute and come back uh, soon to talk about that.